uh, we'll get this up on the website as soon as possible. So thank you once again for being here. Let's just remember a few rules of engagement for being here. Um, like I said in the chat a while ago, it's not a webinar. There's not experts and an audience. Uh, we're here to not believe that any one of us is, is right or smart than anybody else. Of course, there's some incredible expertise in this that's been, that we've purposely invited, of course. But we will run now in, for uh, another one hour and 54 minutes. Uh, we'll be having two panels that we'll go into in just a moment. The whole team's going to be here to <laughs> welcome and introduce everybody. We have the chat as well. I think our record, someone will correct me, is something like 1,200 messages on the chat in one forum. So that's the record to go for <laughs> if we want to do it tonight. Um, but most importantly, you know, this is supposed to be a safe space, and it, and it will be one where we can ask questions, we can speak vulnerably, we can open up, where we lead with kindness. And, um, you know, a healthy discussion is wonderful, but, you know, pointed debate is, is not really our style. So I think many of you have been here before. If you haven't, you are so welcome, and it's so nice to be in your company. Um, We've got a lot to cover tonight. I've been looking forward to this immensely. The pre-conversation blew my mind, so I can only imagine where we're going to go tonight. So thanks for being here with us. Thanks for making it so special. Um, we'll spotlight some speakers in just a moment, and I'll ask Jerry if he could um, introduce our invited guests tonight, and we'll get going with the proceedings, shall we? Thank you, Richard. My pleasure. Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome, panelists members of MKAI's global family, MKAI champions and guests wherever you are. Friends, we think we've put together another fascinating, insightful and impactful event for you, and we really hope you enjoy it. We have what we believe to be a truly incredible lineup of distinguished panelists for you, all of them feature on the global MKAI list of amazing people. MKAI originally asked Chris Rock to make these initial introductions, but for some reason, so lights, camera, eco action. First of all, I'm honored, starstruck and delighted to invite you to know the truly astounding Sandra De Castro Buffington. She's an executive and producer of social impact entertainment aimed at bringing diverse voices and perspectives into storytelling to unite and uplift audiences across divides. As executive director of Bridge Entertainment Labs and founder and president of Story Action, Sandra works with film, television, and emerging media professionals to accurately and consciously reflect the most important topics of our time. Sandra is co-producer of an important new film entitled Brainwashed Sex Camera Power, which premiered at Sundance Film Festival this year, 2022. Time pressure won't allow me to tell you more. Live from Los Angeles, USA, please welcome Sandra De Castro Buffington. Thanks so much, Jerry, and hello, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Now, did you want me to speak or are you going to introduce others? I wasn't sure what the, what the plan was. I think we talked to you for a minute or two first, Richard, and then yeah, we invite so the people welcome, to yeah. join us. Um, uh, sorry, Sandra, I'm rubbish at the spotlights. That's why <laughs> I, just, I lost myself. That's the problem. So I didn't want to speak when I wasn't on the screen. Uh, Sandra, you're, you're so welcome. And the, the thing that you've, you've immediately jumped onto here is this is a, and I'm danger of saying this, but it's a wider conversation, isn't it? The influence of, of stories on society. We've already mentioned TikTok, social media. We've talked about films and TV that have been highlighted in this discussion. But um what start us tonight with this arc of you know what how would you describe the impact of what we hear and what we see and what we comprehend on our screens and otherwise through to how we live our lives thank you for that richard you know for me what we see on the screen creates our normal it creates what feels normal to us it shows us who we are it shows us how we should feel about ourselves. It shows us how to treat each other. It shows us how to love. I mean, what's on the screen has great power. And in, you know, I do a lot of research around story. And what the social science literature shows us is that um, there's a, an effect that's called transportation. 
So I'm going to invite everyone to think about watching your favorite movie of all time. Maybe you were a child or maybe it was yesterday. Maybe you were sitting in a theater pre-pandemic. What happens to us? We lose track of time. We forget our surroundings. We fall in love with the characters. We don't want the story to end. And we end up in a state of suspension of disbelief. And when we're in that state, we have the highest knowledge gains, the biggest shifts in attitude, and the biggest changes in behavioral intention. We don't know we're learning, but that's our peak moment of learning. This is the power of story. So when there is something that's actually elevating consciousness or you know, enlightening our world in some way, it's a very positive thing. And when it's not the case, it can really you know, shape us in ways that we're unconscious about that are actually detrimental. So this is the power of story. Sandra, I don't know how many requests a day you get to record audio books. <laughs> 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 You've got an incredibly listenable to voice. What what are the actual components that you're describing? Because you alluded to some of them there. There's narrative, isn't there? And there's characters and there's placement of things and there's the scene and the timing of things that have been set. Is there a kind of concrete list of all the things that are in play here that you can use as influence or is it more tangible, intangible than that? What I would share with, with this wonderful group is the power of the small moments. So a lot of us think about climate change and we need a whole movie on it. And actually we are going to hear about whole movies on climate change from the amazing Michael Nash, yeah. who is my gold standard <laughs> and um, also a dear friend. Um, but what I wanna talk about is the power of the small moment. So one of the things I've measured in my research are kind of five levels of story. So it starts at the smallest level from just a visual cue. And this is a story about anything. It's not a story about climate change per se, but if you have a visual cue in the background or on the set, that alone can have power. The next level is a brief mention. This could be naming something. You know, this is due to climate. This is climate crisis, whatever it is, you know, and if it's, you know, it's some other related story, this is HIV AIDS, whatever the, the thing is, just naming something, a word is powerful. The next thing is dialogue. And that's three lines of dialogue between two characters. You just get three lines of a conversation, you're impacting an audience. The next is a minor storyline, and that's about 15 minutes in a TV episode. And the next is major storyline, and that's about 30 minutes. And then you can have a multi-episode story arc. All of these have power. They all count, and they all impact audiences. So I would say, you know, don't despair thinking, oh my gosh, you know, I've got to pitch the perfect climate change TV series. No, actually, maybe we just need to approach the, you know, legal show, the legal series, or maybe the, you know, the uh, sci-fi series, or maybe the medical series. It doesn't matter what the series is about per se. The key is to start integrating elements around climate and sustainability into them. Yeah. Thank you, Sandra. Just making sure we set the scene here. So speaking to you, Sandra, for a little while, Jerry describes this as the Graham Norton approach where you, you jump on the sofa and we talk to you and then others join the sofa, but you don't go anywhere, Sandra, you stay with us. Uh, Jay's is looking out for questions in the audience to, to bring those into the dialogue as well. Uh, Sandra, so much in what you're saying though, um, your peers in the industry, do, do they feel responsibility or accountability for the big, challenges we have in society whether that's diseases like you were talking about whether it's pollution <laughs> whether, whether it's equality or do some people think well you know this is entertainment I, you know i don't need to be burdened with that what's the general feeling do you find that's a great question richard and you know let me just tell you a little story about me uh, my the first 20 years of my career were spent working in developing countries. 
on, in the real world on issues of social impact. And that's where I began working with um, content creation for the screen. And, and that's where I learned the power of story. But when I was invited to move to Los Angeles to work with Hollywood, I decided to start by asking writers and producers what their goals were. You know, did they think about having some social responsibility? Did they think about teaching anyone anything? And what I learned in week one of working with Hollywood is that most content creators say that their goal is to tell the most compelling story they can. The most compelling story. That's their art and their craft is the story. And they don't think about teaching while they're writing it. Now, so what I learned is, okay, I can help them make their stories more compelling by making them more accurate, authentic, and realistic. And in doing so, they'd meet my goal. And I decided to take the approach of being the person responsible for inspiration to the industry around social issues without finger wagging, no finger wagging. No, just be a good person. Don't you know how many people you could help if you just did X, Y, or Z? That doesn't work. So I started to inspire them. The climate crisis is so fascinating. It is a question of life and death. There is conflict to resolve. These are all good elements of a story. So why not inspire a creative process by bringing real stories of real people and part of my approach was, because I am Brazilian American, I am dual citizen, I am bicultural, multilingual, and grew up going back and forth between two countries as a child, I knew that immersion or direct experience in a culture or in an issue was more powerful than talking at people. So I started a story tour series to take writers and producers around the world. I, you know, I did a story tour on living off the grid, you know, on Santa Cruz Island. I took them on a toxic tour of Los Angeles. I took them to India and Michael Nash actually came with us on one of those tours to learn from people who lived in the city dump and others who lived in the largest, second largest slum in the world to see what, you know, what it was like to be immersed in environments. So this is how I inspire content creators, not by finger wagging, but by connecting them to real world issues. And they in turn can't resist telling the stories, not because I told them to, no, they don't owe me that, but because they kind of wake up to these issues. And I'll close by saying that most of the content creators I know are very interested in current events, you know, what's timely, what's going on in our world today. So if we can together create really interesting events for the industry, they will tell stories about climate change. Thank you so much. Uh, Jerry, I see Siddharth has, has joined our screen. If you could uh, welcome him, please. Huge privilege privilege to introduce Siddharth Mathai, a TED Talk speaker, eco-warrior, and a renowned sustainability consultant for the film, media, and entertainment industry. He's a film enthusiast. Sid, if I may be so bold, founded GAME, G-A-M-E, after his own personal onset experience in Mumbai, where a director instructed a branch to be cut off a tree because it was obstructing his ideal shot. This led Sid to undertake extensive research. His aim is to help brands, studios and production houses identify their eco-purpose and drive real-world change. Game is founded with the primary purpose of making sustainability actionable in the film, television and entertainment industry in India. He's currently working with top studios and organisations in India like Z, Amazon and Sony to develop their sustainability operational frameworks. He's an alumnus of Mudra Institute of Communications, Ahmedabad, MICA. His research thesis entitled Filmmaking, The Green Way, which looked into different aspects of sustainable production, was accepted and presented at three global confer conferences. Please welcome from Mumbai, Mumbai India, Sid. 
to our panel. And thank you so much, uh, Gary. Thank you. Sid, when, when you think about what Sandra was telling us, um, <laughs> let, let me, I'm a simple person, so you know, the, the, the scene's been written and, and the, the food's being brought in from the supermarket and there's a, a plastic bag on the screen holding the, the food, which, which could have been a paper bag, it could have been a box. You know, it, when you think about the industry, if, if somebody was on set and just pointed out and said, why have plastic? Why don't we have paper? What, what kind of response would we hear? Would they go, oh yeah, <laughs> you, know, you know, are these things, I mean, how do they happen or not happen that the things on our screen are sustainable or not? I think especially uh, in India, you know, uh, it's more about uh, creating that uh, initial level of, you know, uh, awareness to the crew, you know, in terms of um, making them actually realize all these problems, you know, which are really in, in, if you look at other countries, these problems might be very, at least embedded in the mindset of people that, okay, this is wrong, this is wrong. But uh, specifically in India and, and in productions in, you know, uh, which happen in India, people uh, in the entire crew, you know, first of all, they need to uh, empathize and understand that, okay, this is a real world problem and then go to the, you know, next level in terms of getting that uh, in, on the screen, you know, uh, but at least the core filmmaking crew or the core production crew are, you know, nowadays becoming really aware and really able to translate some, some of these uh, uh, items very subconsciously into into the screen so even even uh, without them knowing it so it's it's a very good position to be in uh, right now and hopefully once if we are able to put a structure to it and i think we'll be able to drive more changes are you describing sid a relationship there which i think you may be between the the way that the production is managed uh, and the uh, sustainability of that production and, and how much of that is echoed on the screen, that the two go hand in hand or not necessarily? Uh, as of now, no, uh, but uh, th things look very optimistic. So I'll, I'll tell you in terms of how uh, we approach, uh, you know, a, a production in general. So once we, we have like four to five categories that we try to, you know, improve on a, on a production set. One is something that is, you know, clearly from a resource efficiency point of view, which is clearly to the visual side, know that, you know, the resource consumption is too much like paper cups or single use plastics, etc. So those are the key critical points that we try to, you know, target on uh, at a primary level. Second is, of course, how you, uh, we ask each of the productions to take responsibility of the waste that is generated on a daily basis and how that can be, you know, recycled uh, consistently, not one off way, but on a consistent daily basis, how we can recycle almost 100% of the waste. And the third most important point uh, is, uh, you know, culture and trust, you know, how we can bring about a sustainability led culture on the set which is which which is going to be the driving factor in terms of making other things around it work you know so right right from you know showing empathy to the crew for example i'll give you a couple of examples like uh, we we had replaced the entire you know uh, uh, plastic bottles with reusable bottles to everyone on the set but still nobody you know was uh, using the reusable bottles there was plastic bottles kept at one point and people were still going there and you know, uh, taking those bottles. So I tried to find out in terms of why this is happening and people felt that, okay, the water they feel that they're drinking from the RO is, is not safe, you know? They, they, they had that feeling that, okay, this is not safe. So, so what we did was that, you know, we gathered the whole crew together and you know we kept one one side the mineral water and one side the ro purified water we did a live testing on the water in front of the entire crew and uh, once we did that uh, we started putting numbers daily you know uh, on uh, next to the ro's where this is the you know water purity this is the ph value so people started getting that trust you know uh, building that okay this is something that that is good and, and is equally safe 
so this something you know of that sort needs to be done on the ground and also continuously the communication needs to be placed on the ground in terms of you know why why we are doing this if we are eliminating tissues why we are doing it if we are you know using reusable bottles why we are doing how many bottles we are saving on a daily basis likewise you know just showing that little bit of em empathy to the crew is also so much uh, you know important for example there's one more you know uh, when we were leaving usually when we are shooting very far off from the city of mumbai you know the when people uh, the timings there are really you know very 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 late in the night when people are need to come out of the set around 11 am and it's very far from the main city so i i saw that you know uh, there are practically no lights around the studio at all you know for people especially women etc to you know to travel so we we got together we informed the studio that this is a very major problem and it is obstructing way people think people have that eagerness to wrap up early go home so that they don't feel unsafe so what we did that you know we uh, placed uh, we got together with the production crew and the studio and we installed solar lights right around the campus till the point that there are you know uh, solar night lamps which till the point that you find it visible light for people to find public transport to go home so once we did that automatically people started showing support for all the other initiatives that on the micro level that we do you know so and it is just not about you know uh, environment per se but building a sustainability led culture which is very throughout embedded it's like mental illness and well being is again a very critical thing that you know you find people on the set so recently was you know international yoga day we tried to get you know yoga instructors on set and do a you know live yoga workshop just for 10 minutes not more than that you know which is it's not obstruct we understand how difficult the situation is on the set how time bound everything is so without taking too much away from that uh, but just giving a time a 10 minute of relaxation really opens up a new perspective to to the whole uh, scene so I think that culture building is uh, very critical to ensure the sustainability is, you know, all these simple practices are embedded slowly. Over to me. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'd now like you to meet the final member of our first panel, Hans Style. With an ambition to work in Hollywood, spurred by his immigrant father's love for the golden age of Hollywood, and now a 20 year veteran, of the Western Canadian film scene. Hans is a father of two, production manager and location manager with the Walt Disney Company, who lives for his children's giggles and a big bowl of cinema popcorn. Hans is passionate for the craft and, and processes in film production, and especially developing his craft in the vast and different landscapes in the Great White North. He's chair of the newly formed Directors Guild of Canada, the DGC, BC Sustainable Climate Action Committee, a DGC BC District Council Board member, and sits on the Creative BC Clean Energy Committee. Please welcome live from Vancouver, Canada, Hans Style. Thanks, Jerry. Thank you. Hey, Hans. Great intro. I'm in some wonderful Thanks. company. Thanks. How are you tonight? Yeah, that's, uh, that's awesome and incredible and uh, humbling. <laughs> <laughs> it's so nice and just to say Siddharth thank you so much for your comments as well I was uh, just letting Jerry come in there but you made so many amazing points so uh, I was triggered hands by something Siddharth was talking about around the sets and um, I, I live by myself so the interior design in my house I've got to say is quite limited <laughs> There, there isn't any so I know, I know the feeling i know the yeah feeling. It, it makes a wonderful canvas for the next person who wants to come and live with me right <laughs> the point of that is that i look at these scenes in the films and it, i'm stunned i think wow how how do they come up and how with that level of detail look at the detail and the work and the time and the money that's gone into the visuals in this set right now so coming to what sid asked said hands but like so it must be all on purpose right I mean, everything's, nothing's there by accident, is it? That's uh, exactly right, I think. And that's the thing that uh, I think for those of us that are entrenched in the process of making films, what we start to realize very quickly, uh, uh, when, you're, when you're in the process of it, you realize that getting that story that Sandra and people of 
you know, sort of the, the bigger image or the bigger picture uh, version of this can really articulate so well, which I can't do. <laughs> but uh, the process become reveals itself to you as you're making a show. And then you see all those very deliberate, consequential choices that you're making. I think Siddharth is really bringing light to, you know, the, the process is right in the moment of filmmaking. And there is such a time prior to that when you're preparing and you're building the world that you're going to inhabit and the story that you're going to tell that you're that you have an opportunity to be really deliberate not just in the very overt ways of telling uh having subtexts in the story or having a narrative drive you towards uh the you know the challenges with climate change whatever they may be but also just like you're saying in the set dressing uh for us in in production as Siddharth has, has so well said uh, there's so many steps in it, you know, for choosing a piece of furniture. For me, it's oftentimes, can we source that piece of furniture and, and get something repurposed as opposed to buying something new? Uh, when we're, you know, fueling, for example, vehicles that are transporting back and forth or taking flights to travel people, can we reduce the number of flights because the carbon impacts from those types of behaviors become very, they're, they're a huge contri contributor to our our carbon footprint and that's what we're also trying to really tackle and, and put a crush on so those levels of practice take place not just in the moment of filming but also in the deliberate nature of how we construct you know the shows that we're telling so to your point it is very deliberate and it, and there's deliberate choices that we can make putting the lens of, of uh, climate action or sustainable practices on that process is exactly what we're trying to do here and so when i look at the police or the army some my feeling is that they they don't have a sustainability narrative in their work because they think their work is more important than sustainability so saving lives or you know rushing somebody to a hospital and, and maybe they're right i mean you know you can see the perspective of that what's the mindset you know in in the big studios around the world is it that of the police and the army and the armed services where you know the the with the story must be right you know this is crucial you know i'm not even talking about money and return to investors here but you know the art itself must be pure that you know we can't really be affected by trying to swap this or change that just because it might be slightly better for the environment is that the mindset or is it different or changing well i think it's it's shifting because to sandra's point about how creators are telling stories and how we're this particular topic of climate change and i don't mean to to treat it like a topic, because I do think that it's the most urgent thing facing all of us, this topic is now in influencing the way that creators are telling their stories. So those, those things are manifesting in a way that we use the tropes of narrative, whether it's the, like, you know, I mentioned the good versus evil trope, there's always a good guy and a bad guy in a, in a typical Hollywood show. How do we paint the picture that the bad guy isn't this uh, singular individual, but it's all of our behaviors. It's a hard, story to transform and so as people become more sophisticated and hear from people like sandra and costanza and michael i think you'll find that people will inform themselves and they'll and it'll start to inject itself into the system the the people that are financing and producing these films they want more eyeballs to watch the screen so they and they understand like marketers would <laughs> what the techniques are to get them to do that that's the way the cinematic language and and the marketing and commercial language really is developed right but i think that what we have the great privilege and gift of being able to do like we're doing so well internationally here today is to be able to share all these all this data and the, these stories and to be able to create that culture so that we can reflect it back to the to the showrunners, to the creators, to the writers, to the directors, so that they start to nudge forward uh, and think a little bit harder on this, uh, and it and starts to influence and impact what they're doing. Uh, it's very simple to say we're going to swap something out and and uh, say you know I think we talked about in our pre meeting for example you're doing a chase car chase sequence and swapping out a hybrid vehicle ver versus using the big standard SUV that. That an FBI agent or a bad guy might be driving, right? Those types of choices we do present, and I think that there's more palate, more uh, uh, desire to want to do that within the stories, the shows. But it still, it still has to lend itself to what the larger story is, because that's what's really compelling people to watch the program. But that that example, that SUV example, it's bigger than the environment. It, it's a means of showing the the strength or the power of that person somehow. So, right. what, what do filmmakers do instead? Then 
do they have to find another means of, of changing the SUV up? Or perhaps is it more about relevancy and thinking, well, that's not really how power is actually represented in society now. And we're, we're yeah. an echo of society. I mean, you want to be relevant, right? Yeah, I, I think you're, you're 100% dead on. But I think but starting that conversation, even reframing a car chase, I mean, how what's more compelling than a car chase? Uh, for, for a lot of people in Hollywood, we can spend days and days and days trying to choreograph and orchestrate how a car chase is going to be filmed, how it's going to take place, what's the story point. And I think for people like us, we have to sit with our showrunners and our creators and say, are we really telling a story that's compelling by having a, a day long conversation about a car chase where we're doing this? Like maybe getting rid of the car chase is very much the thing that we need to do because it doesn't actually move the story forward and it's not as compelling and it's a trope that's been beaten to a pulp. And that's maybe something that someone that's very uh, involved in the conversation like me, I might say at the table and oftentimes I'll get laughed out of the room because they're saying, well, the whole point is to get this person, this character from point A to point B. And I say, well, is there another way to tell that or make that point? Or do we have to show that? Or can we use the language of cinema to, to, to further that? Sometimes it does get laughed out of the room, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes someone will say, you know what? There might be an idea there and you get to explore that idea. And that's how the conversation will change, I think. New ideas, being curious about it, being nice. curious about the story. For us, you know, sorry, I just want to say one last thing. Scripts are like scripts are like Bibles to, to filmmakers, right? Scripts are like Bibles to people that are working in this in this fold. And so when we sit there and we're analyzing what a script is, it's really crucial for people to understand that the overarching story is also something that we need to wrap our heads around as practical filmmakers, as people that are craft people in the in the in the in the, in the trenches of the work. Not people that don't read scripts won't understand that. And, and it's really a great exercise. It's a literary form, I think, that's really underestimated. You don't get a lot of exposure to them at the library or at bookstores, but it's a wonderful way to start to understand and see past what's just really happening on screen and, and getting to the motivations of the characters and what the narrative drive of the story is. I'm going to come back to the whole panel in a second and check in with Jay's along questions shortly after that. But Hans, I'm just curious, why why are you getting laughed out of the room, and what what's what's so absurd about what you're saying there? Maybe I don't understand. <laughs> well, it is uh, it's it's oftentimes an old way of thinking, and it does take a little bit of. Sometimes it takes a little bit of, like I was saying before. Sometimes it takes a little bit of culture to be able to say something with integrity and be able to sit there and and advocate for it, right? Uh, to go back to what I was saying prior to the, the event starting, I was talking about the Red Scare and how film history was really formed in the 50s and 40s around the Cold War and some of those events. And having that culture for me has helped me be able to not get laughed out maybe as many times because I'll often say, well, you've seen Dr. Strangelove or you've seen, you know, Aaron Brockovich or you've seen, you know, The Day After Tomorrow. And these are all big Hollywood tentpole kind of films that accomplish things on different levels. But if you don't have that culture of cinema in your back pocket, it's it's going to get you don't have you don't have a justification in the room. You don't have the clout to be able to suggest to people there's another way to frame the story or tell the story. That's 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 the crucial part about being a film lover. And then also being a filmmaker, I think, is having a love for for watching and, and then a love for for making, you know. Thank you so much. Hans. Coming back to our, our main group, um, Sandra, I'm with you for a second. Um, wh where do you think this has worked before? We've heard references to LGBTQ that I think I brought up and smoking that Julia mentioned. We obviously think famously about Tom Hanks and AIDS and so on. Is there a, a track record of, uh, I suppose, more uh, prominently Hollywood in the past, but now, of course, you know, it's different platforms where it, the social narrative for good has been changed through the power of storytelling in, on the screen? Has it worked? Absolutely, Richard. And um, I, if you don't mind, I want to answer. I want to mention a couple of things before I answer your sure, question. Of course, of course. Um, I th one of the things that jumped out at me is what Siddharth talked about around culture. The culture is something. The culture behind the scene, behind behind the screen. So that's the culture, and Hans was talking about it too. You know that we need to be attentive to the culture um, behind the screen before the story makes it uh, to the audience. 
And then we're also talking about on the screen, culture change around what we see on the screen. So we're talking about these two very interconnected worlds, but they're different. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, there is a Green Film School Alliance. And these are film schools and they're the leading film schools around the world that are committing to green production. And they're using something called a sustainability checklist. I know that USC Film School um, is, was one of the kind of co-creators of this Green Film School Alliance. So I'm mentioning this to the group in case anybody wants to look into it or get their local university or film school to join or to participate or to use the sustainability checklist. So um, those are two things I just didn't want to forget because I think they're so relevant. And then to your point, Richard, about you know impact. And so for example, um, seatbelt use in cars. Seatbelts were, that whole change in society was driven through TV and movies. Um, the designated driver, you know, I think that was started by MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, but the designated driver is a real culture change. You know, it's not a thing you can buy. It's not a thing you can sell. It's actually just a change in culture so that drunk people don't drive. And you have one friend who doesn't drink that night so that sober friend can be the driver. That was all driven through television and movies. And so, you know, the um, same-sex marriage is another thing. You know, I actually went to a conference led by the legal team that was trying to push sex, uh, same-sex marriage through all the policy channels. And they said, you know, we worked on this for a decade and we got just so far, but we couldn't get it the rest of the way. They attribute the success to um, uh, uh, Will and Grace. <laughs> I was trying to think of a TV show, Modern Family. I mean, the shows that I think you brought this up in the beginning, Richard, started showing same sex couples like any other couple with kids and life challenges. It, that's what I'm saying about it creates a new normal without finger wagging. We just get used to seeing same sex couples. There's so many examples. Um, I also wanna bring in another topic we haven't addressed in case there are content creators here in the room is this idea of intergenerational fairness. And this is a story that we're not seeing. I'm, I'm certainly not seeing, maybe some of you have examples, but I um, met with a woman recently, who, Kat Tully is her name, who's working with countries around the world on intergenerational fairness and, and, and climate change being the centerpiece of this work. And she already, Portugal's president has committed publicly to be an intergenerational steward. And he commissioned an intergenerational fairness assessment framework so that journalists and policymakers can review pending legislation through the lens of intergenerational fairness. And apparently there are three more countries. Um, Wales has a Futures Generation Act um, to hold governments to account. And again, this is around climate. Um, Finland has the Committee for the Future. I guess Singapore has something too. So I'm saying there are so many stories in the real world that we haven't yet seen on the screen that are relevant to sustainability and to you know, mitigating this crisis we're in. And, you know, these are things just like seatbelts and, you know, drunk driving and um, same-sex marriage, all of these important issues that can change. And I, I wanna give one more example, Richard, and, and this is um, around a Canadian TV series for children. And many years ago, when I launched a climate change initiative for Hollywood, um, our opening event was held at Norman Lear's home. And there was a Canadian uh, filmmaker, TV creator there. And this led to a three-year conversation we had. So I kept working with them because they wanted to do a climate change series for little kids, knowing they'd be the decision makers of the future. And what they ended up doing is transforming the story in, it's called Scout and the Gumboot Kids. 
And maybe Hans, you could say that with a Canadian accent. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it properly. Scout. Oh, you got it. You got it. <laughs> um, but what they did is instead of focus on climate change, they focused it on falling and having children falling in love with nature. They fall in love with nature. Every single episode is a group of kids. There's also animation who go into nature every episode with, um, you know, what do you call them? Looking glasses, those lenses, I can't remember what they're called. Um, different things, science tools to discover what's out there. And it shows them each episode has a mindfulness moment where they taste a berry or something that is edible from nature. And they just have this moment of presence to the beauty, the power, the awe, the wonder around nature. Who can harm nature after falling in love with it in that way? And this is another way that we change society. I happen to know those uh, filmmakers, Leah and, and a bunch of that family of people. So that's great, wonderful uh, reference, Sandra. Eric Hogan for, oh, is the creator. It's a great plug for Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, Canada. Thank you so yeah. much, Sandra. Thank you, Hans. I was expecting Jaisal to hop in, actually. Um, but yeah, the, I was just looking at the questions, uh, isn't it? <laughs> and, uh, I, I would just, I just like I to just, know, yeah, go on, Siddharth. We're going to ask the exam question today as well about the actual the role of but Siddharth. With... I just had a very interesting conversation last week, you know, so whenever we take up any new shows uh, for you know, doing the entire sustainability end to end, we have a half an hour briefing, uh, you know, with, with the creative team in terms of what all things you can do, you know, to integrate sustainability on screen. And uh, in India, if you see, you know, mythology is a very, uh, you know, popular genre. So this show that I was I'm referring to is a my mythology based show, which is in, you know, uh, in, in, in quite in the ancient time. So I was talking to the producer and the director and they were telling me like, you know, in our show, there are no cars. Uh, people are just wearing, you know, a simple cloth. We are drinking water from earthen pots. What we can do to, you know, show sustainability on screen. I was like, this is exactly what you need to show. You're shooting 80% of your screen time is nature, you know. So you when when you make your main characters uh, talk about that, you know, this is the place that, you know, we want to, uh, you know, have, have, have it preserved, you know, for our future generation. This is what we need to say. It's absolutely, you know, uh, like you have so much potential to build this uh, in your own stories. You don't need to... Uh, you don't have plastic bottles you don't have so many other things and people are still li living a normal life so that really opened you know a horizon for them to give a basically a direction in terms of what all possibilities that exist you know to showcase the simulator even in those days yeah Thank you. Thank i wonder you oh, yeah. i would I was just going to say it, it's another another topic and probably you could do a whole month of topics on what we've <laughs> lost Certainly in, in BC. Uh, we've lost a lot because we don't listen to the First Nations here the way we could and their their reverence for nature. Uh, but I think that that's true for any culture. And, and it's a hard that's another hard topic that uh, probably needs its own session. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Hans. Uh, uh, Richard, if we are okay, I'll just ask the questions from the chat, uh, which people are interested in. So, uh, Hans, this uh, an interesting question that has come up from Anas, and uh, I think most of the people on to uh, the audience might be interested in. So, uh, what they have said is storytelling and uh, the movies do move the people about climate change, uh, but sometimes a lot of people think it's just a documentary unrelatable. So what can, as science students, they want to understand, you know, what can they do so that the layman uh, could find it more relatable and re uh, real? And also, if you could share some tips for short time reels or TikTok content creators, what do you think? Can they also influence the people with, with uh, the changes that we want and look for? Sustainability, climate change, whatever we have been discussing so far on the panel. Yeah, I mean, 
I don't know if I can go go ahead and somewhat speak to it, but I think that sometimes when you when you talk about films like uh, like I said, uh, any 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 kind of disaster film right away is is uh, you know the day after tomorrow. Roland Emmerich I worked with a, a few years ago, and a lot of his films are big Hollywood blockbusters that translate across many cultures. And there's this always this peril that you're you're sort of running from, right? There's a global uh, you know earthquake or whatever it is that's happening. In the, on the planet and you're running away from this and you're following these compelling characters it's usually very recognizable and and uh and familiar and lovable character actors that are in the lead roles and those types of films are very overtly obviously about climate impacts sometimes though connecting that particular uh moment of why this this global catastrophe is taking place is a very hard connection to make and uh, filmmakers don't always want to be overt about it. There's a little correctness and corporate, you know, correctness because nobody wants to take responsibility for for having created the problem. So it becomes it becomes hard to tell people you can you can actually take responsibility for it because we're all responsible for it, and that's part of our our moral our moral responsibility as people as humans. Uh, it's just hard to get a corporation to make that concession, I think, and so. Those things are one way, I think, of telling those stories. But I think the actual more compelling ways are ways when we start to connect the dots. And things like refugee stories about refugees are very uh, potent and very powerful. And there's so much identification for people across cultures. Well, a lot of what we're going to experience and what we've already experienced over the years is refugee crises happening because of the impacts of climate change. Now, all we need to do is make that connection and to say, climate is ha having this impact on these cultures. And so they're moving and losing their homes and having to go through political or social strife to get to a new place. That connection needs to be made. I think Sandra probably works with people that understand that and are trying to find ways to integrate that into the storytelling. I think it's interesting we went through the pandemic and a lot of people haven't yet made that connection or haven't started telling the story. And I don't mean to say this because I think it's accurate or not, but you always, to go back to this echo horror thing, one people always talk about the zootropic diseases that we're gonna have come through because of climate change. Now we're gonna have these experiences of diseases coming out because of the impacts of, of climate on our, on our world. And what that means, we're going to have global pandemics that are caused by climate impact. Uh, I think that those things become more compelling. Maybe it's something that people will explore in the next few years because this global pandemic was it hit us all. But I'm curious to see how that happens. For people like me, all I can remind people of when we're making those shows and and in conversations as a union person or as a as a as a worker <laughs> is to just say these are things that is, are pertinent to us and they're pertinent to our culture. So we want to integrate them into the into the conversation. Anyway, it's not to monopolize here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Oh, oh. I, geez, I see the wonderful Coco Warner has put her hand up. I'm so wow. pleased you're here. <laughs> I'm so Beautiful. pleased you're here, Coco. You know everybody here, don't you? So does that mean I can hop in? This has been such an interesting conversation. First, kudos. Oh, only if you introduce yourself. <laughs> Oh, hi everyone. My name is Coco. Um, I work at the UN Climate Change Secretariat. So we're the ones who do the climate negotiations. And some of you we've had a chance to bring into our very unique climate negotiations world. Richard, I know that you and, and a couple of your colleagues were with us just a couple of weeks ago. So thanks a lot for this. And Michael, of course, a shout out to you and so many friends. Thanks a lot for this really interesting conversation. I'm curious um, to you, Hans, Sandra, Michael, are there compelling narratives around transformation? Because I've seen in movies or books or other kinds of, sorry, there's a storm out here. I hope that's not too loud. There, there are some really compelling stories about personal change. Can you imagine that kind of uh, transformative story being brought to bear with climate change? And I ask because um, some of you around our world of climate change tell stories of eco horror or great stories of sacrifice. And, and that's certainly one thing that we're seeing. But I'm wondering if there are ways to inspire people 
to kind of lean into a future. It is scary, um, but there's also a lot of potential that that we haven't we haven't explored yet. So not finger wagging, also not sugarcoating. How do we how do we thread that very fine needle? Thanks so much. Interested in your thoughts. Is that aimed at somebody, Coco, or do you want Jaisal to direct that around the room? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking because Hans, Sandra, and Michael, um, you've been able to share different perspectives or also maybe Siddharth, if any four of you had a thought on what could be narratives that would be compelling and perhaps along the lines of transformation, have you seen anything that works? Yeah, I, I, would, I would just say... Um that when Sandra and I went to Mumbai on this kind of story tour, we were with a lot of writers and kind of showrunners from Grey's Anatomies and other folks. And I had just kind of finished a film called Climate Refugees. And this kind of goes with what Hans was saying earlier. Um, one of the conversations that I had with some of the writers was, you know, and this could work for Grey's Anatomy, it could work for a medical show like House, as people start migrating into countries because they can no longer survive in the country that they once lived in, as they cross borders, so do diseases. So imagine in like a Gray's Anatomy or a house where someone comes to the hospital, they have something that they haven't seen yet before. And there's this complete investigation that kind of goes on. They try all sorts of things. And then finally, you know, someone like House comes along and realizes that this is from another country, it's crossed over because these people are migrating. And now we, you know, kind of illuminate um, an aspect of climate change through a personal journey of an individual that really, I think, would, uh, would, in, would bring in a, a lot of folks, um, you know, from an enduring standpoint and, and, and just from, a, from an emotional standpoint. So that's just one, one, one example. That's a great example, Michael. Um, if you don't mind, I'll jump in. Jaisal said, okay. okay. All right. And Coco, thank you for raising this question. And basically you're, I, I, I'm hearing you ask us to lean into the solutions because what we tend to see is the catastrophe. And very rarely do we see what you called the transformation. And that's something I'm very interested in as well. And I, I also want to say that Michael Nash, for those of you who don't know, created this incredible film, I don't know how many years ago, Michael, called Climate Refugees, at a time when we didn't really know what the climate crisis was going to look like. And he went around the world to investigate. And he ended up documenting real stories of real people. That's the most powerful thing you can do on the screen. Real stories of real people and real nations about what, how climate was impacting them. He showed countries that were sinking under, you know, below, um, what do you call it? Ocean level, what's the term? Anyway, um, he showed, you know, whole nations that are gonna have to migrate off their islands because they weren't gonna exist anymore. So th that was the beginning. And I always say Michael is ahead of his time. And, and I, I think Coco, you know, by the way, I worked on the TV show House almost the entire run every season. And we were the ones, our, my team, to bring those creepy crawly weird things in jars and all those weird diseases that house would eliminate till they got to what was often a very simple household cause or issue. Um, so I think Michael's right that, you know, if we have the, and again, it goes back to what I said in the beginning, it doesn't have to be a TV show about climate change. It can be a house MD, it can be a Grey's Anatomy, it can be a Law and Order SVU, it can be any detective show. But we, you know, we begin to show, and I think Coco, one of the questions is, is what is the transformation? Do we have real world examples? Because now I get to methodology about how we inspire a different kind of storytelling. And what I would say is, let's do a series of panels for the industry, this is what I do, and I do in a certain place in a certain way, and Michael's been there, he's been on my panels before, so he knows well, that begins to get at some real stories of transformation. Not to tell them, oh, you should do this story. We never tell them what story to do. But if we can begin to give real life examples, and even if it's small scale, 
Hollywood, they're the master storytellers of our time. Hollywood, Bollywood, Nollywood, Sollywood, Rio Wood. You know, it isn't just the US. You know, there are creative capitals all over the world and we need to reach out to all of them. But again, it's bringing very edgy, interesting, new voices, case studies, real world examples, experts they've never met and never will meet unless we connect the dots and we and I'll host the conversation I volunteer this is what I do and we get this really inspiring conversation going what happens next we say at the end of the night for those of you who want to do a deeper dive we're going to be doing a story tour or an immersive experience and we take them out to the field to see this and to meet the real people Get out of the bubble. That's number two. What happens after that? You get five shows. They'll write to me, email. We're going to do a storyline. Will you bring your experts into our writer's room? Then we go in with the either the real people, the real stories, or a combination of the experts, and they get two hours to ask any question they want. And this is how we help them make the story authentic and realistic and accurate. And you know, sometimes they even send me the script for script review. I had one Disney TV show that for three years sent me every single script to review before they went to production. This is the kind of relationship we want around climate change. So Coco, I, I think we don't have to think of what the story should be. We have to think of where are the real life examples of transformation that we can connect the industry to, and then they'll tell us how to tell the story because they can tell the story better than we can. Very, very well said. Thank you so much. Um, I thought I'd take a little natural pause in the conversation to say we have uh, more speakers coming, but I thought I'd introduce uh, Michael Nash just before we jump into the next ones. I think we'd probably need a separate event to do justice to his biography. But to introduce Michael Nash as a filmmaker and artist would be a huge understatement. He founded Beverly Hills Productions, more than a decade ago, and Movie Maker Magazine named him one of the top 10 movie makers on the planet. Nash is an honored recipient of the Social Change Global Institute Filmmaker of the Year Award, the California Conservation Champion Award, and the Neiman Marcus Visions Filmmaker Award. His documentary, the multi-award winning Climate Refugees, was screened by the United Nations for world leaders and policymakers. Robert Redford called, it, called the film an agent for social change. He currently has several projects in development, including a documentary with Leonardo DiCaprio. He's also a mixed media artist whose art has evolved with technology, and he now focuses on what he calls hybrid art, art which combines both hands-on artistic ability and generative AI. His work is avidly collected by celebrities and high net worth individuals. He sits on a UN advisory panel focused on global content for change and is a global keynote speaker on issues of humanity, climate stress, food security, and migration. So once again, welcome. Wow, thank you. All that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, and don't forget, we asked for short bios. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was hoping that would have been shortened. Um, it's look, it's a, it's a, it's wonderful to be here, um, Richard, Adelia. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed the first hour of listening to you all. Um, for myself, you know, I'll just kind of give you a, a, a little rundown of what I've been up to for the last decade and kind of things that I'm looking forward to doing but um for myself this all started now as a filmmaker making traditional kind of independent art house films and um I, I think you've heard a couple times this film called climate refugees and for me back in 2008 2009 when we started talking about this climate change was really polar bears greenland and it was 50 to 100 years away and we started asking the question, is there a human face of climate change? If there is, what does it look like? Is there anything we can do about it? And we traveled to 48 countries in search of the human face of climate change. One of the early decisions that we had just from a carbon standpoint footprint, if we were going to do this and travel this much, you know, we certainly wanted to minimize our 
carbon footprint. So, so to many of the places I went by myself and to other places, it was only myself and my producer, Justin Hogan. And we ended up hiring local people from indigenous tribes and things like that um, to, to minimize our carbon footprint. But what we learned by doing this was we found storylines that we would have never learned about had we not had lunch and dinner and been invited into these folks' um, homes. And you know, the film came out, it was, it was a Sundance film. And I remember the night it came out, our world premiere, um, a filmmaker came up to me, a well-known filmmaker and said, uh, you know, I was like, man, I'm so, I'm, I'm so glad this film is finished. I'm ready to go on to my next project. And he's like, well, what are you talking about? Like, you're not even halfway done with this film. And I'm like, no, no, you don't understand. The film just world premiered, it's done, I'm moving on. He's like, you have no idea what the next three years are going to unfold in your life. And he was right and I had no idea. And, and I think the conversation that we're having today really is, is attempting to illuminate my own ignorance after I made this film and, and, and I began to realize that when you create a film that becomes a tool for civilization to, to, to view, to use, to educate, to motivate, um, you know, it changed my life. It changed my own journey in life. So for the next three years, I traveled around the world again, um, you know, illuminating, um, sharing the story that we had found when we traveled to all these places. And for myself, um, and I think th there's a lot of filmmakers, you know, on the panel here, I think we know, especially documentary filmmakers, that if we just make films about the facts, we don't really engage many people. Facts are kind of, and so what's really important um, is that you know you learn to sell the facts through the heart. And Sandra had mentioned this earlier. You know, we really went to global citizens around the world, fishermen and farmers, and we wanted to hear their stories of what happened. You know, fishermen that had lived on islands for hundreds, if not thousands, of years, who are now being forced to relocate because sea level rise was about to sink their country. Um, and through all of this, I, I um, and by the way, Coco was in this film and Coco and I have, you know, had a wonder, wonderful relationship and I've been working with the United Nations since then and helping them, you know, just understand better ways to tell more positive um, narratives in the space of climate change. And for me, I think what's really, really important about all of this is how do you take an observer and turn them into a participant. You know, how do you take someone who walks into a theater? Because when we'd have these call to action screenings and we'd have Q and A afterwards with myself and you know these scholarly people, you could see the energy in the theater where, where people wanted to change their lives and make the world a better place for generations that aren't even on Earth at this point. And what we learned was. The next day, you know, their car doesn't start, their baby gets sick, the rent is due. And, you know, within a week or two, all that energy that you created that night has dissipated. Um, and so the real, the real focus that, 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 you know, that I've tried to kind of figure out and I've been working with the United Nations on is how do you go from observer to a participant? How do you keep that person participated in this movement on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, basis a, a yearly basis? Um, and that's why I'm really excited to, to kind of be on this, uh, this call today to share with and, and also learn quite a bit about, um, you know, turning observers into participants and creating content um, in that fragile space where, you know, whether you call it edutainment or entertainment or entertainment and, and, and uh, education co-mingle. But um, I think it's really, really important I think the world that we live in today is fueled by opinions more than facts. And I think truth is so hard to come by. So um, yeah, I'm excited to share and learn today. So thanks. Thank you, thank you, Michael. It was uh, wonderful to hear you, such important points you make. I'm so curious, I have a question for you. Uh, what lessons did you learn from your first Climate Refugees movie? that you will take into the production of, uh, of the second? 
Um, I think the, the, the biggest le lesson, and um, this was actually mentioned earlier about, uh, you know, generational um, inequalities and stuff like that. One of the things that I learned that was never in the first film, but as my own personal journey kind of going through all of this, whenever we went to smaller countries, indigenous tribes, it was amazing how they included the wisdom of their elderly into everything. And when we go to G20 countries, G or, you know, G7 or G8 or, or, or you know, and, and we started talking about this, it just became really obvious that they throw the, they threw the elderly kind of out to pasture. Like they were done with their work years and, you know, let's just throw them out here to make sure they don't get in the way. And within those elderly folks really can come great wisdom if you allow them to be included in the conversation. So that was, that was one of the things that I hope to dig a little bit deeper into on, on, on the next film. Um, the other thing, and I and I've kind of mentioned this before is, you know, I, when you create, so we're doing the sequel um, to Climate Refugees 2, and I've partnered with Laura, who's on the call, and Leonardo DiCaprio and his father, George. And um, the film is going to illuminate kind of what we found in the first one, which was, as we went out to all these places in search of the human face of climate change, what we found was a civilization where overpopulation, overconsumption, lack of resources, and a changing climate were slamming into each other. And out of that collision, people were being forced to relocate. Um, they were crossing borders. Some were crossing borders. Some were staying within within their, their country, but some were crossing borders and creating conflicts um, to the point where there is now conversations in the, in the Pentagon where about climate wars with all these people kind of moving moving around. And the numbers of people that, that could be moving around are, are, are astronomical. Um, so I, I would just, I would take the four things that we learned in the first one, and, and I'd like to expand on because I think it's really important not to create climate films that drive a wedge politically, but actually include everybody. And so I'd like to really get into the cost analysis from a actuarial standpoint of what this is, all, what this is going to cost us. Um, and, and it would be very, very solution oriented. You know, I'd really wanna paint a picture um, through the facts and the truths that we learn about how to create a better tomorrow. Great stuff, Michael. Thank you so much. Looks like we have a new face on here. Um, I would like to introduce Costanza Burstein. I hope I said it correctly. It's a nice name. After completing a master's of arts in anthropology of development studies, she worked on gender and environmental impact in India. In 2018, she acquired special training in visual research and filmmaking at Goldsmith University where she directed her first short documentary, Pani, P-A-A-N-I, of Women and Water, which was selected for several international film festivals, presented at COP24, COP24, and distributed by the Royal Anthropological Film Institute of London. She's now working as a film director, producer, and researcher, collaborating with different international productions, foundations, and NGOs. Please welcome Costanza. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to be here today to talk about this important topic with such an impressive group of people. Um, well, um, talking about the role that films, but in my particular case, the role that visual anthropology and visual ethnography can have in mitigating climate change. Uh, in my view, I strongly believe that in order to tackle environmental crisis, there's my view, there must be a shift, a shift in the way we see, perceive, and act and interact with nature, as Sandra was mentioning before. And this shift has to come from an anthropocentric approach, which is the one that we are used to that assume that humans are a superior species and all the other species are separate objects to kind of like use for the well being of humans into an anthropocentric approach, which is a nature centered view that see all the species equally and ones that needs the other to survive. And I believe that in order to achieve this shift, film and film industry and 
uh, audiovisual media has a very strong power uh, and also like the tool of visual ethnography as a with a film film methodology can can give a good contribution in that then i better explain like as michael was mentioned just a while ago there are all over the world there are people there are individuals there are communities that are really far away that live in very remote areas very far away from the main public debate conferences or policies about climate change but still these are some of the people that are the most affected by climate change and environmental degradation and because they are so exposed they often own the knowledge the tradition and the way of interacting with nature that can be a real inspiration for uh, the rest of the world and for many other communities so being the one that has to deal day by day with this sort of uh, harsh environment they are the one that along time they develop strategies and techniques and the way of adapting and i feel i believe that these are really important teachings and are also could be very important reminders on how we can live aside of nature right so here comes how like visual ethnography can be a strong film methodology that i use personally as for documentary but i believe it could be applied in many different contexts because visual ethnography allowed to explore to film and to portray distant this distant and far away micro reality and make them closer to the external world like you can show a micro story and portray i you can show this small specific story and this story portray a bigger phenomenon which is the one of climate change that we are facing every day right and visual ethnography is a perspective from within that means that the filmmakers emerge themselves completely into the into the in, into the community where they're working with and not only they observe the interview and they film their characters but they also participate in their daily, daily life for an amount of time and so it's not a big crew it's just a very small crew maximum two cameras maybe you know a little bit of the local language you work with cultural mediators has a way of like has a way of uh, interacting with that community. But most important is the relationship that you build up with your characters and the solidarity and the sort of like non-judgmental with through this non-judgmental and the mutual learning approach, the filmmaker and the character start the filming process in this part through, through a participative and collaborative approach, right? Is a sort of co-directing in a way because the subject became leads you into into your into their daily life and into their places and show you their practice and in a way take a very important role in shaping the story with the filmmaker right and in this way the camera not doesn't became something that's like divide but at the opposite it kind of became transparent and uh, it can became a very powerful tool of empowerment and can bring people closer in a way um, like visual ethnography can become a cultural broker bring culture and reality closer and this can can promote change in, in two different levels according to my opinion from one side because it brings uh, awareness to an external audience as we said several times before right because someone who live very far away can see and can learn and can be inspired by these realities and at the same time they can also see similarities that they would not expect right and on the other side i think it's very important to say that uh like you, there is there there can be a change and a, and a change of self-awareness that involve the characters that has been uh, part of the filming process and uh, and the, their agency in taking part of this process and becoming leaders of change. I want to conclude just with this small example. When I was shooting my first film, Pani, I was uh, I was shooting in this desert and the Rajasthan at the border with Pakistan, uh, and I was shooting in this small community, documenting the relationship that local women has with water in a context with no run, running water at all. And at the beginning, I was feeling very shy because I was like, oh my God, now I'm going to spend the next month filming in their houses every day with the camera. It's going to be intrusive. But then suddenly they told me something that they, that really gave me strength and confidence to move forward because they told me um, 
they told me, um, you know, Costanza, for us, collecting and managing water in the way we're doing, we always done it. Our, do our daughter will do the same, our mother will do the same, but the fact that you're coming here from the other part of the world, because you think that our practice with water can is meaningful and can teach something to somewhere else in the world. This make us very this, this, that make us very proud and it gives us value. So this gave me a lot of confidence to move forward and we both learn a lot. So I will learn everything, all the things that I had to learn, but I could see that along the process, they also took awareness of the importance of the roles of managing and collecting water in their community and that uh, and and that make them protagonists of this change and I believe that I wanted to end with this because I feel that film also can con like just making the film itself is an opportunity to open discussion and brings awareness as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Costanza. It was wonderful to hear about the role of the camera in raise awareness of this uh, local community and natural resources exploitation. So I will give uh, uh, to Vamir that will introduce our next fantastic guest. Up to you, Vamir. Thank you, Dilia. Yes, fantastic is right. Uh, Laura Cox joins us from Austin, Texas, about a three hour drive from me. I'm in Dallas right now. So that's kind of funny convergence. Um, she's an executive producer, environmental justice organizer and photographer. Her work from Standing Rock was promoted by UNESCO during COP21, COP21. Her work on an award-winning film narrated by Leonardo DiCaprio was highlighted during COP23 by the United Nations. Laura and George conceptualize this film to educate people about pollinators and their plight. You can find it at pollinatorsunderpressure.org. She is currently working with filmmaker Stephen Gute, G-U-T-E, on short films for Confluence Documentary, based on the experiences and struggles of frontline environmental justice organizers around the United States and with our very own Michael Nash, George, and Leonardo DiCaprio on a sequel to climate refugees. She's also shooting a short film called Bring Back the Bear with Stephen Gut and the DiCaprios. Laura believes that building national and international partners within the industry can and will positively influence the public. Welcome, Laura. Thank you for that introduction and thank you all for being here today. And I'm learning a lot of, from all of you and also getting a lot of reaffirmation about the work that we've been doing because we have been working with the frontline people and helping them tell their story because it does help uh, encourage most, both their work and starting the dialogue like Costanz was saying, um, working with Coco um, with the UN and, and them highlighting the pollinator film also was extremely interesting because then it had an international uh, audience with leaders, which you want your films to be seen by leaders if you're trying to create change. So that was an interesting concept and, and aspect that Michael Nash introduced me to Coco. And then also for Sandra, I met with her on several occasions and she also looked at our script that Leonardo uh, ended up narrating for the film. And I, we did work with the US government, Richard, you'll like to know that, that they actually, um, allowed us to make a film that mentioned that pesticides were not good for pollinators. So that was a big deal. Lila Connor is a, an amazing filmmaker. Also, she did Ice on Fire, and that's who we did the films with, uh, pollinator film with. Um, and she also did Green World Rising, which is a really excellent uh, short series that I encourage everybody to uh, watch. But I thank all of you guys today. I, I just wanna let you know that everybody can tell stories and everybody can participate in, in the movement. Um, we use AI with mapping and we're able to create some incredibly beautiful maps that can tell stories that we can attach to stories from like influencers. And we have a lot of really big ideas around what we wanna do with climate refugees and partnering also with uh, larger groups, PR firm, uh, you know, that uh, Media Monks is gonna be um, helping us uh, organize influencers around the world. And it, if any of you guys know influencers that are doing work around environment, um, we also wanna get them involved. So it's, it's an exciting process to 
grow a film that's not been made yet and uh, and grow the call to action before we're even really funded. But we have faith that it's going to get made and um, we're going to really uh, try to create a, a larger scale change that everybody's mentioned a lot of the aspects and parts to, to our to our movement behind the movie. So that's also very exciting. Um, I think we can all learn a lot from the speakers today. Um, uh, I'm, I'm humbled to be in your company. That's great. Thank you, Laura. Thank you to be with, uh, with us this evening. It, we are delighted to, to hear from you. And do you want to tell us a little bit more on the role of influencer in changing this standard uh, narrative also with reference to the work that uh, you already mentioned a bit, but we are so curious, we would like to know a bit more. What are you working on in this moment? Okay, so um, I think for the Confluence documentary, um, it really helped to get more media towards the causes that were happening, especially Standing Rock wasn't being covered by the uh, mainstream media. That's what the filmmaker can do too, and influencers is to when they show up, they're doing these lives, you know, sh what is really happening? Like Michael Nash said, how do we know what the truth is? Well, the truth is right here, you know. Um, so the, the, the Facebook live feeds were, were extremely helpful for the movement. Um, it's not so much anymore because they're doing more, a lot more throttling of, of the, um, the profiles, but uh, film to me is, is the way to tell the story and, and the way to get to the hearts and the minds of the people. So um, I think the influencers do have a, a big role in that. And even like people don't, even some of you may not know what TikTok is, I noticed in the comments, but um, those are little tiny short vignettes that people make and they are really influencing people. And these aren't celebrities. Like we do want to use celebrity voice. It does help. And that's why we work with Leonardo. He's really smart and he's well-respected. But also just any random mother who's gotten the following, you know, or a little kid, um, it's just crazy how it just shifts things. So definitely influencers have a big role and we are definitely going to use them in our call to action. It's a big part of our plan. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. So, yeah. I mean... Uh, I don't want to put you in the spotlight because now I will ask a very difficult question, but <laughs> after watching a climate change related film, so how we can then make this call to action really effective, right? How can we bring people from watching the film to really shift their behavior in their life? Well, um... You can do a, either a micro story or a, a behind an experience for the film. Like we made the film and then I just got, it's been made for like four years now, but I put it on LinkedIn and then a, 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 a professor, his son did a, it was an Eagle Scout and he did it for his project. He did a whole prairie, planted a prairie. He built a pollinator little hotel. He did all these things from watching the movie. So that's a, a micro, you know, inspiration. Um, now it, it then cascades. Now the, the Eagle Scout, um, head of the Eagle Scout wants to show it to the other Eagle Scouts. And then his science teacher wants to show it to the class. And, you know, or meeting Jane Goodall at uh, United Nations and then her partnering with us and then showing it through her whole school movement called Roots and Shoot. Um, and it's an international um, curriculum for kids all over the world and they have their own schools and it's amazing. So, I mean, I don't know, it's just pretty, I'm surprised by how much things can snowball. I mean, uh, the film ended up at the Smithsonian Institute um, and was shown, you know, and, and, and highlighted and then they did a whole pollinator exhibit. Um, it's pretty incredible the things I could go on and on, honestly. Uh, the, uh, one of the schools that we highlighted ended up getting a huge uh, grant from Lori and Jobs to build their own school um, in Houston, Texas. They had they shifted their whole community. In LA, they shifted the community by putting pollinator gardens in the schools. And the kids started 
not having any problems in schools and they started showing up and there were no absentees. Everybody wanted to go to school because they had the garden. Then they started planting along the way. And then the kids started walking to school and the grandparents started coming. So it's interesting how you can shift with calls to action and just by winning their, their hearts, you know, in the film itself. Thank you, Laura. I can also listen to you for hours and hours. And unfortunately, we have time constraints. So that was super That's okay. interesting. Thank you. Thank you. I'll um, give now to Viva that uh, will tell uh, us something very interesting too. Thank you. Thank you, Aditya. I hope everyone's enjoying the event. I'm just taking a 10 second interlude here. MKI. Between our events, we have various forums. I've just put the link of our WhatsApp group, just like how you're enjoying this particular event and the discussions here. Between events, we take those discussions and take them forward on the WhatsApp group. The link's in the chat. Please join us. Please join the MKI community. We don't, this is a space for you to take forward your ideas and thoughts. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Viva. So I think it's time to open our panel conversation. Uh, Jason, do you have already some questions? Absolutely, Absolutely. we have a couple of questions and uh, we can straight away ask them. So uh, one of the questions that I would have is um, uh, for Siddharth. Uh, Siddharth, as you have been uh, uh, you know, uh, seeing that you are doing some practical things onto the sets directly. Are you seeing something similar to what question we have from Himanshu? During filmmaking, characters wear costumes or clothes that are designed specifically for the film or TV series. Are we doing enough to follow the principle of reduce, reuse and recycle? Because you've been talking about plastic bottles, but then we come to the costumes as well. Do you think we are seeing that into Bollywood at the moment? Yes, we recently actually just uh, started this entire service of, you know, asset management, where, you know, we uh, we are starting to track items, right, when they're purchased, you know, we collaborate with the auditors uh, of, of the film or of the TV show, where each item that is, you know, purchased is being tagged. And at the end of the life cycle of the film, the there's an entire warehouse where all these items are stocked, right, from your, uh, you know, set materials to your props to the clothes that, that, that are, you know, uh, gathered there. So we follow an entire process of systematic, you know, uh, uh, disbursement of all these items. So we have tie ups with, you know, uh, different vendors, prop vendors, uh, different costume vendors who would take these items. Many times what happens is that certain, you know, uh, characters, junior characters, which are there, clothes might be worn out, etc. So we have collaborations with NGOs where those items can be, you know, donated uh, to them. So the entire aspect of creating a, you know, circular economy for these assets, uh, we're trying to establish that slowly and trying to streamline a process which, you know, uh, uh, people benefit. Also, for one of the shows recently, which got concluded, we also tried to do a first-hand sale of certain items where we invited, you know, uh, uh, family members of the production house, studios, etc. To come in and you know we have a standard price for these items where whether it's a pair of jeans clothes etc people can you know uh, pick pick them up it's like a small garage sale you know where families come together and you know they pick pick these items because they are practically of no value but they are qualified as an asset to the studio so we try to also ma uh, maximize uh, monetization for the studio but at the same time ensure most of these items go back into circulation or at least they're donated. So some sort of process uh, is trying to, you know, shape up. But I think there's a need for larger collaboration, you know, with different studios, you know, because many times, uh, as uh, it was rightly pointed out, the things are made very customized, you know, highly customized. So it becomes very difficult to reuse items by, say, a different production. So if there's a collaboration between different studios, uh, these items could, you know, reach out more quickly uh, to the relevant people, uh, you know, within the ecosystem. Absolutely. I think these initiatives are going to impact the whole sustainability ecosystem, as you mentioned, uh, I think, and impact climate change. Small initiatives, uh, long way to go to, I think, 
but is going to make an impact. Thank you so much. I have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, so um, I think, uh, Michael, there's a question uh, that uh, we, uh, uh, we should ask you is, uh, do filmmakers find difficulties? This has come from Lalamand. Uh, do filmmakers find difficulties in funding movies and documentaries related to climate change? Oh boy, that is that's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> um, I don't know if there's an exact stat on this, but I would say that 80% of a documentary filmmaker's time is spent on finding funding and finding distribution, which, you know, is tragic because you have all of these filmmakers around the world that, you know, want to illuminate the truths um, and help, you know, to help civilization move forward. And we spend most of our time, you know, looking for funds and looking for distribution. So, so yes, it's, it is unfortunately um, very troublesome. Mm. Absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll just share one other thing that, that Adelia asked um, Laura, which I think is really important. And that is, um, you know, how do you, how, how do you, you know, how can you build on call to actions and stuff like that? Mm. And I mean, this question seems to be constantly in search of the correct answer. Um, it's, it's an incredibly tough question to answer simply based on the fact that when your goal is to change one's behavior, you're literally asking that individual to disrupt their current behavior and people hate change. So regardless of how good your narrative in the film is, or your call to action is the very first thing you have to do is understand the mindset that most of the people are in right, that you're attempting to change their narrative on. That being said, um, what I've found is, is, is key in the success to, to, to creating, you know, good call to actions um, is to create as, as many or embrace as many vertical drivers as you possibly can. That could be films, that could be video games, it could be AI, um, you know, when you talk about going from observer to participant, AI and video games is kind of already doing that. But a lot of the video games seem to be very uh, destructive in their story narratives. Um, but imagine if that was to change. Imagine if we could get kids involved in this landscape of figuring out how to make a better world inside a video game. You know, I also think part of the, the solution in these call to actions is public service annou announcements. I remember when I was a child and I would go in the woods or go camping, I was scared to death that I was going to start a fire because Smokey the Bear told me that only I could prevent, you know, prevent forest fires. So, you know, is there an animal or something that we could create where three to five year olds start listening and hearing from this animal about, you know, how they can, you know, make the world cool, um, you know, by going green or whatever. Uh, so I, I think when you when you were looking at these call to actions, it's all about building a community that is as vast as possible, um, that keeps people really engaged on a daily, monthly basis and daily activities. And then, which this is something that um, I've worked on a lot and, and, and I've worked a lot with, with the, the UN and COCO on is focusing on what kind of is known in our industry as four quadrant films. Uni and universal themes, the more universal your theme is within your narrative and within your call to action, the more people you're going to capture. And so creating calls to action that include equally someone who's seven years old to someone who's 70 years old is not an easy thing to do, but it's possible. And so I would just say when, you, you know, when you're setting up to set these call to actions out, wh whether you're talking about women's rights or indigenous people or climate change or mental wellness, um, really, really important to understand your audience, understand your audience's need and create universal themes to bring them into this, not only from a factual standpoint, but from a, you know, take them on a journey. Um, take them on an, on an emotional journey through all of this. And, and at the end of their journey of this call to action, 
um, they should be able to then talk about their own journey and how it enhanced their own life and their own existence on earth. Absolutely, absolutely. I think inclusion is the key that we are mentioning here as many people get included and you have the universal theme. It is going to definitely make a difference. I think Coco has some question to ask in here. Coco, if I may just uh, tell you that, why don't you go ahead and ask your question, please, rather than okay. from the chat. Thanks, Rosal. It's actually the exact same question that I asked last time, but Michael, since you were talking, I had no idea, 80% of your time is spent on distribution and getting support. Um, from, I know you're artists, so you don't wanna produce for the, the money aspect, but it's a really big part of your world. So it's the same question, what kinds of storylines, um, I don't know, make supporters turn away? And what kinds of storylines excite? And I guess like Hollywood blockbuster type things, they seem to be really big budget and get lots of support. I don't know what it's like for documentary films, but is there a kind of landscape that would help an artist understand if, if you're really interested in Sandra, I loved what you said earlier about telling the real stories and finding really good and compelling stories and finding a way to tell them. So I'm just looking for a way to, again, thread that needle to tell the real stories of real people that, that, us as, that we as audiences would relate to that would also convince a big, um, maybe a studio or whoever supports films that this is not only needs to be done, but is really worth the investment. Michael, would you want to add anything to what Coco uh, has been asking? Um, well, sorry, I was on, on mute. I, um, you know, I think if you look at Avatar, Avatar is, was a massive film um, that had an environmental base to it. And so the new Avatar is coming out. I know James, James Cameron is very involved in the environment and, and hopefully they go deeper into that dive on that. Um, when, when you kind of break down like the, the size of the film, so just take for example, you know, DiCaprio has been mentioned a couple of times. He did a film called um, Blood Diamond. And Blood Diamond got into, you know, maybe the first layer or two of Kimberly certified diamonds and the good and the bad of it. Now, you could also make a documentary on Kimberly certified blood diamonds and go take a really deep, deep dive into all the truths about that world and that reality. That documentary is going to be seen, first of all, by people who are in that world or, or, or understand that world or want to know a little bit more about that world, where the movie Blood Diamond cast a much wider net to you know, tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people. Um, so I think when we're talking about driving narrative and, and for change, um, you know, I think using Blood Diamond as an example, Schindler's List, um, there's a lot of movies that have come out, Blackfish um, from a documentary side. I think you almost have to like create narratives on all fronts in order to keep it in front of people and really drive change. I don't know if that answered your question, Coco, but. Coco, uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, Sandra. Sandra, would you like to add anything? You had raised your hand. So uh, would you want to add anything that Michael has said or Coco has said? Um, well, thank you, Jaisal and Coco. Thank you for raising that. Um, what I originally raised my hand to echo what Michael was saying about calls to action being more powerful when we have what, what I call a dose effect. This is what's called in the research that, you know, if you have a storyline in one movie or one show, you can find measurable increases in knowledge, shifts in attitude and changes in behavior among audience members. But if those audience members are exposed to two storylines told from different points of view, 
but about the same topic or theme, the dose effect, you know, drastically increases those changes in the audience member and their likelihood that they'll take an action or behave differently. If you get three storylines, it's that much higher. So I think what Michael described is, is very powerful is that you have, you know, multiple influences around through story on the same theme with calls to action, reinforcing each other. And, and this is why on the television, when, for example, you know, when we would inspire a certain theme or topic in a story, one show would say to me, please don't take this to any other shows. We want to be the only ones telling the story. And I would laugh and I would never commit <laughs> because we knew that if we got the legal show and the medical show and the um, sci-fi show all telling stories on a certain topic in a very different ways, that the impact on the audience would be tremendous. So again, it's this idea. And, and Coco, you know, thank you for raising the question about funding. And, and Michael, your answer was so good. I mean, this is one of the toughest things. Funding, I was just on a panel right before I came on here, at, starting at eight my time and jumped on here at nine um, out of South Africa. And it was a film festival and, and it was a talk back after a screening of a film I just produced. And the question was exactly this, what about funding? And funding is so politicized. It's so political, Coco. You know, it goes, it really has to do with, you know, who you know, how well known you are. Certain people in entertainment can afford to have multiple failures and they still get big budgets to do their next project. And other people who have really great projects but who aren't as known or connected don't get the funding. So it's a very complicated and political system. And I, I think this I, and I don't have the answers, but the system needs to change. And so I think if anybody wants a project, I think it would be very interesting to map the, the funding flows for films and actually do a study of how it works, how the decisions are made, who benefits, who's kept out, um, and which actual films are being made and which ones are turned away. We don't know which ones are turned away because we don't see them. So. I think it's a great question. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, uh, we have Helen. Helen has uh, raised her hand and Helen has been one of the speakers on one of our inclusive forums. Uh, Helen, would you mind asking the question and for whom it would be? Yes, please. So first of all, I want to thank all of the speakers and the participants. This is a another great um, MKAI uh, forum today. So awesome and good job. Okay, but my question is, I'm fascinated to hear what you think about taking a utopian approach or a dystopian approach and what works and doesn't work and how, are, how do those um, ways of storytelling um, have an influence? Constanza, would you like to add your insights on the question that Helen has asked? I think you're on mute, yeah. I'm not sure I properly understand the question, Helen. Sorry, can you just be more, can you just repeat, paraphrase? Yeah, sure. So there are different approaches that, that we've all experienced in, in the media, especially in film and movies in particular where a dystopian approach is taken to communicate a message or a more utopian approach is taken to communicate a message about the future. So something about like, um, I don't know, Terminator Skynet um, took the dystopian approach um, or you think of ways uh, um, that stories can be told and how this mechanism of a good outcome or a bad outcome to be averted, you know, kind of um, is, is chosen and what is effective and what is not effective and how is this um, 
you know, kind of movie making device used um, uh, in a way to, you know, kind of communicate the message. It, does that, is that more clear now? It's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> does someone else has more like clear answer than- I can like, tell we, we you one little yeah. short story. When uh, Leonardo DiCaprio was making a movie with Lila Connor, uh, and she was, uh, it was called Ice on Fire, and she said, I don't want to make another dystopian film because we have to have hope. So you set it around what we did for the Pollinator movie. You have things that people can do that are positive, or you show solutions. And that's what we want to do with climate refugees. That's my short answer. Yeah, Helen, I, I would just say, um... I'm actually working on a scripted project right now where it has both a utopian and a dystopian world. And, and without like going too deep into it, it's basically, you know, what greater way to illuminate civilization that is alive today than having someone come from the future that is a dystopian world, come back to the past and let us know that, hey, if you guys continue to live in the way that you're living, you're gonna live in, you're gonna live in hell. And so um, it's something that I've been working on. In fact, uh, it was mentioned that, I was, that, that I'm an artist as well. I, I, we have this NFT drop that's taking place based around that storyline um, about this you know, outline that I'm doing for a film right now. So yeah, I, look, I think, I think both dystopian and utopian um, can share a stage and, 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 and stories about climate or, or whatever that may be. I, the, the key always to me in telling great narrative is, it goes back to Joseph Campbell. You know, it goes back to the hero's journey. And so you have a hero and he's gonna travel through this journey. And, and the, the better that journey is, the more you're gonna have people on the edge of the seat. And the way you do that is through the lead characters want and their needs. And so when you start defining all of that and they cross paths and, you know, um, the narrative app kind of starts telling itself, but at the core of all of this, it's a personal journey within a story that the audience is going to follow. And so it's just really creating, whether it's a dystopian world or a, a you know, utopian world, creating a character that the audience can identify with and fall in love with. Can I, can I just hop in? I know I'm not on screens. <laughs> we've, we've only got nine spaces, but um, I think we threw Costanza a curveball there, so I apologize. But I was just thinking when you were speaking, others, that, um, that the narrative around charity visuals it changed over time, didn't it? And there was a period of time where it was all about the individual, wasn't it? And you showed a close-up picture of a young girl or something, and it's like, look, you know, this girl is getting hurt. This exact person that you're looking at right now, I see Coco's got her hand up. Um, and that that didn't last forever, and it changed. And Costanza, perhaps we can come back to you and then Coco. You know, what are the visual things that that hold that power now that you've seen? Well, I believe that what you said, that NGOs language, is something that I always cared a lot. I always like I I grew up watching a lot of. NGOs sending messages that are very negative sometimes and that create rather than be empowering tends to perpetuate power dynamics in a way like for instance the poor kids in Biafra that are like you know this sort of negative narrative that I feel that are not I mean they might be powerful for an external audience if you need fundraising or these kind of things but I don't think that they're very empowering for the people like in term in, in the long terms in terms of like equality respect and the way of understanding each other so I believe also like when you're doing like uh, like NGOs, short videos for fundraising and stuff. I feel that the production and the filmmaker always have the responsibility to think, how am I representing this person? How am I representing the environment and all these sort of things? Because uh, yes, it can be very damaging to portray something very negatively, but I feel that these things is changing in the past few years. I feel that there are more empowering positive messages rather than this sort of message as yes, then, which is sometimes wrong. 
are you exploring virtual reality at all? Perhaps somebody else, if you aren't, Costanza, but I've heard that's an incredibly powerful medium for messages like this. No, not yet, maybe. I would like I would like to in the future, but not yet. <laughs> uh, Coco, did you want to add something? Your hand was up and then down, but maybe you just put it down because it was tired. <laughs> I've also got load shedding in like a few minutes. This thing is still on. They're still okay. discussing. Oh. The kind of effects. It's a bunch of, I think, English people or something. Oh my gosh. Oh, I'm not me. <laughs> I don't think all of us are English. <laughs> just... <laughs> Wonderful. I just, yeah, I just um, found this all so inspiring. And perhaps going back to that last question of which is better, dystopia or utopia? Um, it almost makes me wonder, is there a meta story to be told about climate change? Or maybe it's a Joseph Campbell level of that level of meta that can be told through these multiple ways. What you said, Sandra, really stuck to me. And I could imagine, can completely see the legal um, series taking on something with climate litigation or the medical, got the background of a heat wave or whatever. You can completely imagine all of these different stories bringing home perhaps a central theme of people navigating change together. And hopefully, I do hope it may be, and pardon me, I'm not Asian, but I understand broadly that in the East, there's a sense of collective. And perhaps in the West, there's a sense of an individual hero. Maybe these different ways of telling a story can still emphasize um, that, that meta story, whatever it may be. I found that super intriguing. And I think I'm gonna th be thinking about that the next week. I, I'd like to add something too. You know, uh, it's important for us to think about uh, the reality we're in today when we think about what stories the audience has appetite for. And what I've heard is that during the pandemic, people started shifting their viewing priorities to the positive, upbeat, the hallmark movies that always have a happy outcome because they could not take any more negativity because life was and is so daunting and so challenging and there's so much loss of life at this time that the dystopian lost its appeal. Now, whether that you know, remains over time, I don't know. The other thing is that um, the research shows that the negative um, doesn't have as great an impact on people in terms of behavior change as the positive. So that's just another thing to think about. Um, I liked Michael's idea of the hybrid, <laughs> a little bit of each. Um, but also with Coco, I really love the idea of the meta story because we're talking about human evolution and you know planetary um, sustainability. Like the planet is gonna, is gonna live, <laughs> it'll throw humanity off the planet if need be, and it'll keep going. And so there really is a meta story here. And what is the spiritual implication of where we are, you know? And, and how does that connect to wisdom and the ancient wisdom that's been around for a long time? And how does that connect to our cultures and what we, our values and what we hold dear? And then how do we conduct ourselves? So um, I'm intrigued by the meta story too, Coco, and I can't wait to read yours. I hope you write it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Sandra. So, oh my God, it's one minute to go. So I would like to thank you all for being uh, such incredible guests, Sandra, Laura, Michael, Costanza, Siddhartha and Hans. It was incredible to have all of you here in the same panel. Thank you so much, Coco Warner from UNF Triple C. It was such an honor to have you here today. Thanks, Jerry and Vamir, Vivap, all the uh, MKI teams in the technical part, Alex, Karen, and of course, Richard <laughs> for this wonderful costing and all participants. I saw a lot of messages in the chat and uh, lot of engagements on such a crucial topic. I hope you will continue to discuss about this event 
with your family, with your friends, and you know, keeping uh, balls rolling and uh, keeping uh, work for this important cause. Thank you. I will um, I will hand now to to Alex for our after party. That means that anybody who would like to stay to ask more questions is welcome. So we will not close the call and uh, we will close just when all people uh, will be uh, done with questions. <laughs>